So we kind of left off um, on this slide, the wax co uh, lost wax process, casting process. I do have a video about it, but I think I'm going to skip it because I think this is going to end up being kind of a long lecture because this chapter was actually a little bit longer than, um, than the last one we did anyway. Um, we already kind of went over this. There, I guess I didn't talk about how automo automobile parts, dishes, and a lot of children's toys are many things, you know, are among the many things manufactured that use the casting process. And then we'll talk about Charles Ray's father figure from 2007. It's painted steel, fairly large. Um, it's in New York. Weighs more than 18 tons. So this was actually based on kind of a green plastic toy. And then he enlarged it to life size in plaster before it was cast in solid steel. And it, like I said, it weighs more than 18 tons. It still has a bit of that toy-like quality with, with the way that it's painted. Um, this color green and this wheel looks like a toy wheel. It doesn't really look like a real tractor wheel. And so does this one. This one's very toy-like. Looks like plastic, really. Um, but it, some of it has, some of that toy-like quality has vanished because the father figure is somewhat menacing. And as you can see, he's actually physically attached to the tractor. He's kind of at one with the machinery. Um, moving on to the next piece. Uh, D Dwayne Hansen uses casting, and he actually casts actual people. Um, the models have to basically shave all their body hair, and they're cast in seg segments using silicone rubber directly, and that's applied directly to their skin. And then the rubber coating hardens, and then the artist Hansen cuts it away from the model and then fills it with a polyester resin or an auto body filler. And then he paints them with skin tones. He adds human hair and clothing. And the, the way that he does this, the mold is ruined in the removal. So there's only one of each sculpture that he makes. And obviously the sculptures are realistic because they are made from real people. And they're just ordinary looking, pe looking people in ordinary clothes, base, um, even, even posed in ordinary everyday poses. So everything about them is really ordinary, which makes them hyper-realistic. And obviously being cast from actual real-life models helps with that realistic quality. So Rachel Whiteread, Untitled Hive 1. So she basically is an English artist. She uses casting quite a bit in her work. Um, she uses ma newer materials like polyvinyl resin. And she likes to take empty spaces that we normally wouldn't be able to really view. And she likes to fill them with resin to create a solid form so that we can kind of view them in a way that they've never been viewed before. So much like this thing, this thing was actually Untitled Hive One from 2007. It's resin, and it's actually the inst inside of a beekeeper's hive. And she put this orange brown resin in it, and then she took away the hive at after it hardened, and now it's just the solid interior of the inside of the hive. And so she, you know, replaced one substance with another, basically, kind of. Um, and she's kind of revealing the interior of something we would not normally see with much clarity. And the color of the resin is also indicative of honey. So I think she probably did that on purpose. So we'll move on to carving, the carving method. Um, it's a common method for making sculpture. So you carve away unwanted material to form the sculpture and it is a subtractive process. Um, and Michelangelo, Michelangelo used this method. So we've talked about Michelangelo quite a bit. He did the Sistine Chapel, but he's actually not, he's well known for painting the Sistine Chapel, but he always thought of himself first and foremost as a sculptor. That was his real 
thing that he liked to do. Um, and he most commonly worked with marble. And if we look at the surface on Unwake, uh, Awakening Slave, um, which is by Michelangelo, the marks that are left kind of help to show the steps that he took in making um, his sculptures. And it basically, he kind of worked in stages um, toward increasingly refined cutting. And it's basically an unfinished piece. It's actually kind of neat to see it like this because we see the raw material that he made it from and then we can also see that sculpture starting to take place and almost break away from the piece of stone and it's almost like the slave is being released from the stone which i don't know if that was intentional because supposedly this is unfinished um, and for michelangelo making sculpture was a process of releasing the form from a block of stone and this is a series of four figures, this Awakening Slave is, and the, seri the series of four figures is called Slaves. And all of these um, pieces he abandoned in various stages of completion. So the fact that we get to see the various stages of, you know, of how he worked with, is kind of interesting to see all the different ways. It helps us to figure out exactly how he made his sculptures, which was kind of neat for people. Um, and they say carving is the hardest of the three basic sculptural methods because it's kind of a one-way process and it provides little or no opportunity to correct errors. So once you carve off that piece of stone, um, there's no getting it back. You can't put it back on there. So you have to start over basically. So it's very challenging. Um, before beginning to cut, the sculptor kind of must visualize the fin finished form from every angle within the block of material. And different types of stones have different characteristics, and these characteristics greatly influence the kind of carving that can actually be done with them. So, you know, uh, the characteristic of stone really does help to determine what you can make from that stone. Marble is a common material used by European sculptors. It's fairly soft and workable enough that it can be cut with a chisel. Um, and then the final process when you carve marble typically is they will use an abrasive material to kind of sand it down and polish it. And it kind of leaves a really smooth, creamy surface that actually looks like human skin. So I think that's why marble is used a lot for like nudes and things like that, because it is indicative, you know, it, it, it is, it's, it's very much like human skin. Um, and marble has really been the preferred material for outdoor sculptural Sculpture, sculpture historically, but modern pollution kind of really helps, really does like break down marble pretty badly. So they've stopped using it as much today and actually granite is more commonly used today than marble because it's less sensitive to pollution. Um, so granite has kind of taken over marble recently. And it's also like, if you look at a tombstone, it's more than likely it's made out of granite. The thing about granite is, though, is that it's a lot harder than than marble, which makes carving detail difficult, um, and it can be brittle. If things are really hard, they're usually brittle as well, so uh, that's a problem when working with granite. And then sandstone and limestone are also used, but they're sedimentary materials, and they tend to erode a little bit quicker than granite or marble, but they are soft, and they can be polished like marble can be, so they can be polished into kind of a, a glossy surface. Let me see, um, what is this? Sorry guys, I'm just checking to see how much time I have left on this video. Okay, not too bad. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. I only get 15 minutes per video, so I have to pay attention. Okay, so this piece, what we're gonna look at is a carved piece. Oh, I guess I kind of went over some of this. Uh, jade is favored by the Chinese. So we're going to be talking about a piece. It's called Disc. It's from China, Western Han, Han Dynasty, um, 100 to 220 CE. It's jade um, or nephrite, which is a certain type of jade, and it's seven inches in diameter. And the Chinese are really fond of using the stone jade. It's really hard, so it is quite brittle, but you can grind it or use filing um, to, to help form it. 
and it's only suitable for smaller pieces such as jewelry. And so this piece is called Disc. It was found in a Chinese royal tomb. It's carved with, um, the stone is called nephrite, but it's a type of jade. It's just a rare type of jade. And this stone was ground or filed nearly 2,000 years ago, and they used drills and quartz sand in a really time-consuming, laborious process. And there's a lot of these little raised circles, and they're so regular, it's amazing that they were able to create such perfect um, pattern of circles. And they're called bosses, these circles are. And they are really perfectly lined up in rows. And then there's kind of like this feline monster up here, or a dragon type monster. Um, it does look a lot like a cat though. And it has kind of this motif behind it of like waves or something indicative of, you know, wind or weather, clouds. So that's a that's an example of carving from China in jade. And we'll move on to wood carving. Um, walnut and cypress is pretty much the preferred because they have strength, but not so much strength that they're brittle. So they just kind of have just the right amount of hardness, um, but yet not so much that you can't work with it with relative ease. And obviously the sculptor will begin with a block of wood. They might draw on that to help visualize the design a little bit better. And then they use a variety of tools to carve it. Gouges, chisels, that kind of thing. And then they'll just subtract from that block of wood until the final form is reached. So we'll take a look at Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Catlett, mother and child. Um, so it kind of has a lot of sweeping curves, essential shapes, it's abstract. Um, and it's kind of a highly polished wood piece made out of walnut. It's 38 inches high, fairly large. Um, so it's called Mother and Child Number 2. The gesture of the mother suggests anguish. And they think that maybe it's over the struggles all mothers know a child will face. And it, I was kind of thinking that maybe it's the mother struggling herself because raising a child is not easy. Um, both figures are abstracted. And there's a lot of, like we said earlier, sweeping curves. Um, so this curve here, curve of her head here, the head is round. There's another curve here. There's a lot of diagonal um, forces, I'd say, especially in these two um, arms. And they kind of feed off of each other, you know, they kind of in a cyclical way almost. It's almost framing. These two, two arms are framing uh, the inner head shapes here, the two shape to the two heads that are in the middle of the composition. So um and they kind of mirror each other, you know, I mean they're very strong diagonal lines. And this wood has been polished so much and possibly oiled as well, which makes you kind of want to touch it because it looks so smooth. And you can see there's kind of a faint outline of, of her hand here. Okay, we're getting there. Maybe I'll just go ahead and pause here before we move on to constructing and assembling.